welcome to the Orthodontic Products Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Werner. Today we have back with us Dr. Roger Levin of the practice management consulting firm, Levin Group. He's here to help break down the findings of our third annual orthodontic practice survey. Dr. Levin, great to have you back. Allison, it's wonderful to be back. I love doing the survey with you. I'm glad it's our third year and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Great. Well, as I said, this is now the third year, and the survey asked orthodontists to tell us how their practices fared the previous year. So we're going to be looking at 2023. Um, before we dive into the details and get into your advice to doctors and staff who are facing some of the challenges reported, what was your overall assessment about how orthodontic practices fared as businesses in 2023? Yeah, if, if I had to pick one word, and I like to do that, I would mm -hmm. say stability. Yeah, things were fairly stable. We had uh, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a rapid rise in overhead in 2022, the biggest rise in overhead in any single year right. in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And in 23, it went up a little bit more, but production in practices in 22 and 23 was fairly stable. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see that it's down a little bit. It's not all, it's not gloom and doom, mm -hmm. but I would say it was a year of stability that uh, this is the first year since 2020 that we are back to a more normal landscape, mm -hmm. normal scenario. We don't have any huge problems. Even the economic problems are limited, although mm -hmm. the fact that people are seeing some issues with their everyday goods like eggs and milk and things like right. that, mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing a little bit of a production drop. Uh, but I want to be positive. Any practice that looks like right now can use the year 2023 as a launching pad to, to do really well. Mm, okay. so that's great. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So let's start by going through some of the findings and let's start by talking about production. How did 2023 stack up against 2022? So I love data and statistics and you can make them sound like a lot of different things. The, mm -hmm. the fact is that production overall dropped in orthodontics in 2023. Now, as I said, it's not gloom and doom. Mm -hmm. It dropped by about 4.7%. So nobody has to panic. If I start panicking, so I don't panic, but I would panic mm -hmm. when I hear me to practice this down 10% or more. If they're down 10% in a year, any of you listening to this, that's when you really need action and help and turnaround. You don't want that to get worse. I'm not real concerned about the 4.7%, and I'm not not concerned because it's a one-year data point. The mm -hmm. question, as I wrote in the article that you'll be publishing, is, yeah. is this the beginning of a trend? I've talked a lot about orthodontics getting a little bit more competitive. I mentioned in the article, one of the biggest DSOs in the country now offers orthodontics through its general dentist at $1,999. They have their own brand of the liner. So whenever you see competition, you've got to pay attention to see how you're stacking up. Uh, the one comment I make always is your goal is to increase production every year. Mm -hmm. If you, It doesn't have to be by a lot, but if you can do that, if you can increase production every year, you are going to be somewhere between good and great as a practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you talked a little bit before about how we're kind of stabilizing in terms of, you know, those, those, you know, different, you know, those unique years of 2021, 2022, because of the pandemic and everything. But one of the things that is happening or kind of looks like it's happening in 2023 is that that pent up demand due to the pandemic and all the savings that was built up is kind of disappearing and we're kind of riding the ship basically. Right. If, if, if I were an economist looking at orthodontics uh, the last few years, it would be impossible to get a handle on it because the mm -hmm. pandemic was so unusual. In 21, the pent up demand, many of our client orthodontic practices had record years, even though they were shut down from four to six weeks right. uh, and they were exhausted by the end of the year. Uh, in 2022, overhead skyrocketed, and there was still huge pent-up demand coming in, people deciding to have ortho. What, what happened to some degree was that people weren't spending money. So they were sitting at home, uh, saving. They weren't spending it on travel, luxury, entertainment, or restaurants. So there was all this extra money. It wasn't the you know, twelve or $1,400 they got from the government that let them right. do ortho. It was yeah. all the savings. But by 23, we know that savings is disappearing. Now, how do we know that? Because credit card debt now is back to an all-time high. 
When uh, nobody right. nobody puts interest on their credit cards if they have discretionary mm -hmm. income to spend. So right. we have definitely bumped up against the excess savings that people could use for ortho, and now we're back to doing orthodontics only for people that really want it, not people who in the past wouldn't have gotten it, but they had extra money, so they decided to get it. So mm -hmm. I think that is a definite contributory factor to the slight drop in production in 2023. Okay, so keeping that in mind and kind of some of the other economic headwinds, what strategies can practices employ to continue to grow that production? Well, here's what's interesting. You know, I'm 39 years into this job, so I'm mm -hmm. I'm almost at halfway in my career at this point, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and I love I love looking at the numbers over the years because it tells mm -hmm. us so much. The mm -hmm. average practice in 2023 <coughs> produced one million five hundred thirty-five thousand dollars and change. Okay. But we know because I've built these models over and over and over, and we've worked with over. 4,700 orthodontists since 1985 worldwide, mm -hmm. mainly U.S., but worldwide. Mm -hmm. We know that any solo orthodontist can produce $2 million a year in four days a week comfortably. We see, we see Pete, a small number, but we see people that do that in three days a week. You know, ortho has what I call the volume factor. Unlike the rest of dentistry, you can put a lot of volume through. And later, probably toward the end, if I'm uh, mm -hmm. anticipating your questions, I'm going to talk about how you might be able to double or triple the orthodontic practice without working one more minute. But for now, the main point is there's a big gap, a half a million dollars or 25 percent between where the average practice is and where it can be. The other way to say it is most orthodontic practices could easily increase production by $500,000 if they had the right strategies and referral marketing in place. And that's an enormous, okay. enormous opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's go back and talk about practice overhead and what the um, findings for this survey reported or showed. And I know it said you wrote that it uh, overhead was on the rise. So yes. what did what did practices report for this year? Yeah. Well, I'll start with the good news. The good news is that the overhead rise was pretty small in 2023. It okay. went up about. Uh, eight to nine percent in 22 it went up another one to three percent in 23 not not bad it's slowing down you know based on you know what i know about production and my career has been dedicated to identifying systems and strategies to grow production based on what i know about that which is is fairly deep uh we can make up for a one to three percent overhead increase in production in any given year but okay. 59% of the orthodontic practices survey did report they had higher overhead. And only a smaller number, 13%, reported that overhead had actually gone down. So it's not a surprise. You know, the cost of everything is up. And it, yeah. the increased costs from 22 due to supply chain, due to staffing heavily, I'll get to staffing in a moment, mm -hmm. those costs are not going to come back down. So we must mm -hmm. increase production to offset them. What I teach, which is very well proven at this point, mm -hmm. is lowering overhead's good, but you can probably only lower it about three to four percent, maybe five or six in rare cases. But you know, mm -hmm. if you've got waste, you need to eliminate the waste. The problem is overhead reduction is finite. You can only go so far, and once you've done it, right. you're done. You can only fire an yeah. assistant once. You can't fire her twice or three times right. if you're trying to save money. But mm -hmm. production can increase infinitely. It can go up 2%, 5%, 20%. Uh, again, most orthodontists underestimate their real potential, which unfortunately means they're not as protected, that mm -hmm. profit goes down. The problem is if overhead goes up and it's not offset by production, at least equally, profit goes down. So we're seeing a lot of practices that even increase production and profit's still down 3 or 4% a year. So what you want to do is understand that lowering production is a limited gain. Rate, I'm sorry, lowering overhead is a limited gain. Raising production is an unlimited gain. If you can grow at 12% in a year, or a lot of our clients grow at 18% the first year and the second year, 18% each, then that's going to offset any 2 or 3% increase in production 
with a 13 or 14 or 15 percent increase in profit. So overhead's gone up. It's going to stay up. Why? Staffing is a crisis. Yeah. It's a different podcast for us to do someday, Allison. Um, <laughs> yes. I get every dentist I talk to, every new client that comes in is struggling with staffing. Um, mm -hmm. And I could I could list the top 10 negative factors of the staffing situation today. Bottom line, mm -hmm. we've got a shortage. It's not going away anytime soon. It, it, I think it's with us for at least 10 years and I can't see beyond that. Mm -hmm. So we need okay. better systems, smoother running practices, more technology to offset labor. But in the meantime, staffing's up about 10%. And that mm -hmm. means production has to go up at least 10% to offset the staffing increase, it's not going to come back down. So if anybody's waiting for it yeah. to reverse, it's it's going to go up more. It's not going to come down. Yeah. And we have some real challenges in staffing, which are number one, there are people who are afraid to work in medical and dental because of they're still worried about COVID. I know most people are saying, mm -hmm. oh, it's over, but there's still people mm -hmm. who are worried. Number two, a lot of people now want to work from home at least three days a week. Those people are not taking jobs in orthodontic offices, so they're off the table. And number yeah. three, we had about six to seven percent to eight percent of our orthodontic staff retire at all ages. They just decided they're done. Uh, and okay. I guess unless they become financially challenged, they're not coming back. So we have a, a smaller labor pool. We're hiring less experienced people that need training and the costs are way up for all of that. And if you look at minimum wage, you know, there are articles every day now about minimum wage in California. It'll be the rest of the country, $20 an hour for fast food. Um, mm -hmm. That's a that, that, that's a 25 to 50 percent increase in labor. We're only at 10 percent right. in orthodontics right now. Uh, yeah. OK. OK. So the, it's time to start figuring out other other strategies. To oh, yeah, increase. absolutely. Yeah. And, and you want to okay. we can talk about this later if you want, but you want to keep yeah. the staff you have. That's the best way to avoid all the other pain. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the the message here is we're going to do a separate episode on just staffing. So look forward to that. Uh, <laughs> Stay tuned for I'll that. Be happy to. I've, been, I've been doing a lot of work in that yeah. area because we have to. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, let's talk about patient volume and what the survey found, because yeah. that does tie into dealing with, you know, countering overhead. You do need to get that production up. So you need that patient volume to be up. So was it up or was it down? Well, according it, to the survey? it, it 72% said it was the same or up, which which okay. is interesting because if production's down, you know, a little under 5%, how, mm -hmm. how is volume the same? And the answer mm -hmm. is several things. Number one, the volume of referrals does not always reflect the volume of starts. So right. referrals may have been steady, and we're going to talk about that, I know, but mm -hmm. the starts may be down. We have more shopping. Mm -hmm. We have more options. Mm -hmm. We can go to a DSO, staffed by general dentists. We can go to mm -hmm. general dentists who are doing aligners. And that's really interesting when we get to where referrals are coming from. Uh, this was a mm -hmm. really interesting finding. But six, uh, it's interesting that 72% said that their volume was about the same. Uh, so I found that interesting. Uh, but in reality, their volume wasn't rising. And it may be that if you don't have more patients, a higher percentage converting to starts, then you need higher volume to make up that difference. So the fact that we don't have mm -hmm. higher volume is the thing to really pay attention to. Don't get comfortable mm -hmm. saying, oh, I've got the same number of referrals or consults. And by the way, it's not in this survey. In another mm -hmm. look, we found that up to 16% of parents or patients that call an orthodontic office never make an appointment for a consult. Nobody tracks that. Mm. So we, we, we didn't ask it in the survey because nobody would know, but we did take a hard look yeah. at a large number of client offices and new clients so that it was random. And we found mm -hmm. that when we start with them, many, as they start tracking, have a number of calls coming in that do not schedule for consults. Uh, yeah. And they're asking questions like, well, how much is ortho? Or how long will it take? Or do you do this type of procedure? The front desk staffs are not well trained to handle those questions. We need scripting for that. 
Okay, yeah. so the, the the inquiry from the pa from the pr pr prospective patient or consumer is changed. Right, and the front desk staff, and they're very nice people. I have great respect for mm -hmm. them, but they yeah. are only good right now at the standard basic new patient calling and wanting to make an appointment. Mm -hmm. They're not good at building. It's not. It's not. They can learn it. They can easily learn it. Yeah. yeah. But they're not yeah. good at building value in the mind of a patient that has questions. So. Every practice should at least write scripts for the top six or seven questions that you get from a new patient caller. This is this is now a good idea. In the future, it's going to become critical. Right. It sounds like it, um, especially as you know, consumers now can, to a certain extent, can com better comparison shop even just online to get you know look what are the average prices in my region or. You know, they do have those ads from those DSOs like Aspen. Yeah. It's freely advertising, very publicly advertising what they charge. So yeah. we've gone from years ago just... saying things like, well, we'll tell you that when you come in. And that worked back then mm -hmm. to yeah. focusing on value building. The new patient call is the first step of what Levinga calls the new patient experience. And if you don't get that right, you have missed the boat in a big way and your start rate, mm -hmm. they may not come in, they may not show up and they may not accept treatment. All higher if you don't have a great new patient experience value building process in that first phone call. So the front okay. desk person has to think of themselves as the first treatment coordinator they meet and then they come in and they meet the second treatment coordinator. That's how I view it today. That's a good, yeah, that's actually, that actually makes a yeah. lot of sense. So. Okay. Well, so let's break down the sources of new patients. What were, what did uh, respondents yeah. report? So I want to warn everybody, <laughs> there's a lot of bias uh -huh. out there about referrals from general dentists. We, uh, you know, and I want to warn you, this is data. This is not my opinion. But <laughs> this year, the, it was a change as the number one source of referrals. The number one source mm -hmm. was from referring doctors. And this is really interesting because what we show in our surveys is that approximately 3.6 billion, with a B, 3.6 mm -hmm. billion dollars of revenue is referred each year from general practices to orthodontists. Now, it may have been more okay. five years ago. We're only in our third year, Allison, of doing this with you, so uh, <laughs> so we don't really know. But the number one yeah. source, uh, you know, 38 percent of patients were coming from referring doctors. So I, okay. I I want to be careful because that's the kind of, we do, we have a whole program in referral doctor marketing and I don't want to sound like I'm mm -hmm. leaning towards something because that's what we do. This is complete data, right. completely objective, mm -hmm. but I encourage people, build your referral marketing also for referring doctors. Don't say they're doing all the ortho or they don't refer. We find a lot of new clients who tell us that they're not getting referrals from general dentists because the GPs are doing all the ortho. We find two things. Mm -hmm. One, they're not getting referrals, but the GPs are not doing all the ortho. They might do some. They're referring it to other orthodontists. And a year later, we're getting lots of referrals from referring doctors. They had just never focused on it. And since it didn't just automatically happen or it didn't happen after a few strategies, they decided, well, this isn't going to work and they gave up on it. Well, if you're not doing anything, there's a very good chance you won't get referrals from referring doctors. Uh, I'll read mm -hmm. you the list, which I have in front of me. After, yeah. after referring doctors, number two was referrals from existing patients. So a lot of dentists mm -hmm. think they're just, or orthodontists rather, think they're just so well known in the community, and, and they may be, mm -hmm. but it, it's really referrals from the parents and patients that are a huge segment. So you don't want to just have you know, little little contests for the kids. You want to have, you know, eight, nine, ten different strategies. We have offices right now giving out the new Apple virtual reality uh, uh, oh, know, glasses. Now they're thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah. So you don't buy ten of them. What you do is you buy one and mm -hmm. you make it a six month contest where people can enter to win. Okay. And then it's thirty five hundred dollars mm -hmm. over six months. So you know, for some practices, that's a great idea. Third was okay. referrals from existing adult patients. Now that's going up regularly. You know, in the past, okay. adults were not the big referral sources because we didn't have aligners. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to do bracket and wire. And honestly, mm -hmm. a lot of orthodontists don't like treating adults because you know they've got an opinion. They are not as easy as the kid. <laughs> they, they, they don't come right. in, plug into their AirPods, and never have to talk, you have to, talk mm -hmm. to them. 
So the mm-hmm. adult, <laughs> I've said for years, the adult market was the greatest unexplored frontier. And I'm predicting that these yeah. adult referrals are going to grow as a percentage of practice referrals every single year from here on for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, third mm-hmm. was social media. Uh, but it's not growing. It's interesting. Social media is so hot with orthodontists. And I like it. And you should have it. Don't misunderstand mm-hmm. me. But number one, it's yeah. hit or miss. I, we get new clients who are doing well with social media, and we get new clients who are not doing well with social media from the same social media companies that they work with. So nobody has, you know, every social media company I talk to, because we get called a lot, would you recommend us to your clients? And they always kind of come at it from, because we're, we have this secret way of doing things that gets results. Everybody thinks they have mm-hmm. the secret sauce. And the truth is there's no secret sauce or we would all know it because everybody would be reading about it or publishing right. it online or Google would tell us or whatever. Mm-hmm. But social media is important, but it's not growing as a referral source. It's flat, which is fine. Okay. Uh, and it's a little bit up from 22. It went from 12% in 21 to 9% in 22, back to 12%. So if you only look at last year and the 22 and 23, you might say it's up 3%. That's a true statement, mm-hmm. but it's only back to where it was in 21. Uh, and again, right. I spent a lot of time looking at this data to try to understand it. And finally, the thing that mm-hmm. dropped off, interestingly, was community activity. Yeah. Right. I was now, I have too. different theories, and I don't know which one's right because I don't have any data yet. Okay. Are orthodontists spending less on community activities because of the pandemic, or ortho- which is over? mostly mm-hmm. or orthodontists mm-hmm. spending mm-hmm. less because things are more expensive uh, or or is it just less effective and people are relying on other sources for their referrals going forward i don't mm-hmm. know yet but okay. i'm going to be really interested i made a note next year the first thing i'm going to look at is referrals from community because if it's flat or down then that's a new trend that we're looking at it could have just been an off year i don't know yeah so what's your overall takeaway from this information about referral sources? Well, my takeaway hasn't changed. Just like investing your money, okay. uh, diversify. Do, don't spend all your effort. We meet people that only focus on the patients. We meet people that only focus mm-hmm. on social media. And that's great until it runs out. And, and usually they don't realize it's running out till about three years late. Orthodontists have what I call a three-year mentality. We don't wake up and pop up with a sign that says, oh, I have a problem till about three years in. Mm-hmm. And then and that then ah, it takes okay. longer to reverse. So number one, mm-hmm. I would diversify between referring doctors, patients and parents, and include a subset of adult patients, uh, the community and social media. But I would not do it evenly, 25%, 25, 25, 25. Based on this data, I would put more investment into referring doctors. I would put the next most investment into patients, the third investment into social media, and then the fourth investment into community. I would stay with the community, but I would back that down quite a bit based on what I see here. Mm. Now, having said that, okay. uh, you have to monitor your referrals. You've got to understand referral marketing. You need a minimum quantity. The big secret here is to, not just to have quality, you know, a good social media campaign Mm -hmm. of high quality doesn't do it. You've got to have quantity. How many times do you have to touch referring Mm -hmm. doctors? How many times do you have to touch uh, parents, patients, and adult patients? How many uh, impressions do you need with social media? You know, back in the old days when we only had print advertising, you may remember this, they said it took 17 times seeing an ad for the ad to be effective. Mm-hmm. Well, social media, right. it could be 78 for all we know. You know we, we just don't know. Yeah. So mm-hmm. based yeah. on this, I would definitely stay diversified, but I'd reallocate where I'm emphasizing. And if I were a new orthodontist, mm-hmm. I would go out of my way to build my general dental referrals. Even if they're doing ortho, mm-hmm. most of them are definitely not doing all the ortho by any means. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So now let's switch to the okay. challenges. And we've touched on a few of these already, but we asked orthodontists to identify their top challenges for 2023. So... Here you go. All right. <laughs> How so did I'm it go? Yeah. This comment first. Um, 
I am a huge believer in the economic law of supply and demand. And in almost every survey I'm ever involved in, and, and we're involved in others in the rest of dentistry, we do surveys for William yeah. Blair, the largest um, Wall Street analysis firm to analyze uh, public companies. Uh, so they want all the data. They, they engage us for proprietary surveys. I always start, before I interpret it, asking, does the law of supply and demand apply here? So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. For many years, and back when I was in practice as a general dentist, everybody did well. And we all thought we were brilliant mm -hmm. and good at it and great practice builders. But to a large degree, we were fortunate that the supply of dentists and orthodontists was low relative to the demand for services. So it's mm -hmm. not a matter of being lucky, but the fact is we, always look, we all look brilliant when the supply is low and the demand is high. Well, that's shifting now, okay. and it shift, it's past the uh, neutral point. It's starting to shift where, and I've talked about this with you before, 25% of practices are going to have better careers than ever in history. And the next 25 are going to mm -hmm. have good careers. The next 25 are going to have much tougher careers, and the bottom 25 may not even make it. They may end up selling and working for someone else. The, we're seeing that fragmentation. Okay. So we have challenges yeah. today, and the biggest challenge is not enough patient starts. Well, sure, because if I have enough patient starts, then nothing else matters. I've got I've said forever, mm -hmm. the only two things that really matter in building a world-class ortho practice are the number of referrals and the number of starts. Everything else is just operations. Yeah. Every orthodontist can do most of the cases really well. You have to have patience. So yes, patient starts was ranked, and these are not my rankings. These are ranked, we have eight, I'm gonna read all eight. We have eight challenges that were ranked by the orthodontists in our study, and this is what they reported. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so yeah. challenge number one, not enough patient starts. Well, what that really means is not enough new patients. And it wasn't reflected heavily in the data, but they may be feeling something. And I've always said when an orthodontist feels something's wrong, they're usually right. People will call me and say, I just yeah. feel like we're slowing down. And their practice is still stable, but when you feel it, you're just mm -hmm. ahead of the curve. In most cases, you're right. So if you're feeling something, mm -hmm you're probably right. So number one, okay. not enough new patients okay. starts. That was reported by 71% of the respondents. Number two, rising overhead. Well, that's a vestige of 2022. If we stay stable from mm -hmm. here on, then in a couple years, the fact that it's higher than in 2022, everybody will forget that and just say, yeah, we're, yeah, we're fine. Yeah, kind of flatline. In flatline, that's, that's a great yeah. word. <laughs> and, and you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Allison, you just summed up the whole thing beautifully. Better than I, better than I. There you go. Um, number three, ability to, and it's interesting, ability to retain and hire clinical staff. Mm. Now, why is that so interesting? Okay. Because in the general practice survey we do, uh, separately from this, that's mm. published in a general practice publication, this was yeah. number one. Staffing was number one in 2020, um. number one in 2021, Number two in 2022, overhead took the number one spot, but back in 23, right. it was back yeah. to staffing being number one. So I was kind of surprised to see this as third, but 48% uh, mm -hmm. said they staffing's a, a huge challenge. But we also know that 64% yeah. of orthodontic practices are currently looking for one or more team members to add yeah. either as replacement or additive. Uh, number four, competitive mm -hmm. threat for GPs. 38% um, said that. That is more subjective. I, my theory, I could be wrong, my theory is they're more mm -hmm. focused on it because they're annoyed about it. They don't like GPs doing ortho. It means they're not referring okay. to the orthodontist. They don't feel the GPs necessarily have the skill set, mm -hmm. which is kind of true in that a lot of GPs do yeah. aligners because the AI is in the trays, artificial intelligence, uh, but not because the GPs mm -hmm. like me have any additional ortho training. So I think there's a bias there, but okay. either way, as I've mm -hmm. said to many orthodontists, get over it and deal with it because it isn't going away. Uh, number six, declining okay. insurance reimbursements, always a challenge. Seven, competitive threat from DSOs. That one's gonna move up. That one's gonna get bigger 
because DSOs yeah. like ortho and they're just starting to add more and more of it. And some of the big GP yeah. DSOs are starting to add specialists as well. And number eight, mm -hmm. competitive threat from direct to consumer. Well, interesting, that, that was number eight <laughs> all the way down at a lowly 6% mm -hmm. because it's basically gone. Yeah. Will it come back? Who knows, yeah. but it's not here now. I would worry more <laughs> about AI right. in aligners allowing GPs to be, you know, just distributors for aligners to their patients. That's a reality that I talk about in my yeah. lectures. Yeah, that's a good point. And so maybe that's something we have to yeah. look at in the future surveys is the yeah. Well, there's a company out there, and I know we're going to get to this, so I won't do it now, but they've got like yeah. 126 mm -hmm. data points now. Not not for aligners, but but for monitoring. Mm -hmm. And I'm studying monitoring really yeah. deeply because it, it, it's going to be a huge factor. Mm -hmm. And a lot of orthodontists are still in the denial stage. And I'm not an orthodontist. I don't yeah. tell people how to practice. I look at market forces. And in my career, I've been mm -hmm. very uh, fortunate in looking at market forces and saying, okay, this is something that's going to explode with growth once it hits the inflection point. But again, my point was not that. Yeah. It's AI driven. AI is going to play a bigger and bigger role yeah. in, in the whole world plus orthodontics. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one of the things you break out in the article is you do go a little more in depth on dealing with the staffing challenges, which, you know, in this year's survey did start, yeah. came in at number three. So you identified um, three, or no, mm -hmm. sorry, four opportunities or no actually no, I've got, what was I've got four for you. the top answers for yeah yeah okay. oh okay go for it <laughs> <laughs> so here's what's really important uh staffing mm -hmm. is not a shortage it is a crisis and even if your production yeah. is not dropping because of it which does happen the rest of your staff is exhausted mm -hmm. so if we had six or 12 hours mm -hmm. I can talk about staffing from every dimension plus burnout. I've, I've read four textbooks now <laughs> on burnout just to understand the difference between fatigue, frustration, and burnout. And, and again, that's not for today. Mm -hmm. My main message is yeah. you want to focus on staff longevity. You want to measure that every year. Mm -hmm. And I could give you many, many, many things to do, but let's go through the four. What, what four things did orthodontists mm -hmm. say? This isn't Today's podcast is not about what Roger right. thinks. Uh, if, Al, if you think yeah. it, Allison, it's very important. If I think it today, it's not. Uh, it's, it's about what did our respondents <laughs> say? And they came up with four mm -hmm. key things that they're doing to try to retain their staff. Number one, increasing base compensation. Okay, that's a no-brainer because you're not, people aren't going to take jobs mm -hmm. if you don't pay them enough. And everybody knows with full transparency, right. what everybody's making. And if any of you have an illusion that your staff is not sharing their compensation every day at lunch, mm -hmm. then you are living in the dark ages. They, they know exactly what everyone's mm -hmm. making. Uh, there's, there's, there are new laws yeah. now in many states where you have to publish the compensation in your ad by law, and it's gonna go national, it's gonna be everywhere. Yeah. Remember, uh, it is a labor right. market, everything happening is in favor of labor. And uh, I don't take sides. I have to deal with what's happening. Uh, a lot is going to be a lot of mm -hmm. regulations going toward labor. Uh, for, here's an example. We have yeah. a client in California that had to pay a fortune mm -hmm. to a 20 year employee who quit because they never gave her 10 minute breaks on the regulation cycle. And she came oh, back and yeah. sued. And yeah. I, I a lot a of thing. money. It was not small money. There, there are laws yeah. on when you get breaks, how yeah. long lunch has to be in different mm -hmm. states. Every state's different, yeah. but pay attention. Yes. The so number one, yeah. increasing space yep. compensation. Number two, providing more bonuses. And bon the word bonus, you have to be careful, uh, has a lot of different mm -hmm. meanings. I've written a book on bonuses, uh, and it's, a, it's one type okay. of bonus. But there are many, there are bonuses on compensation. There are bonuses on number of conversions. There are bonuses on completing cases on time and overdue D bonds. There are bonuses on collections. You tailor the bonus to what you need to focus on in your practice. Right. Now if you put a if you put a gun uh, okay. to my head and say, well what is the best bonus? Uh, now that I've said well there isn't just one, it would be a production based mm -hmm. bonus for the team. Yeah, you know, where everybody shares equally okay. over a certain amount. So a bonus is not a giveaway. 
And the Christmas bonus is not a bonus. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares. Nobody thank you. It's the 27th paycheck. Mm -hmm. If you if you give Christmas bonuses, it's just expected. Um, number three, okay. adding technology for productivity enhancement. This is going to be big. And technology, it's early. It's very early, despite all the workflow technology. I am now studying workflow technology mm -hmm. and how it can increase production and efficiency and even replace certain labor and certain functions. And the reality is that technology is going to be essential. Simplest example, you walk into a McDonald's, there are no cashiers, you order at a kiosk, and then you pick up your order. Why, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. Well, originally it started to save money in the testing phase, but now because they can't get people to work there and higher minimum wage, it's getting very painful. And finally, number four, offering mm -hmm. more and better employee benefits. There are people to the health care is a fortune. There are people that want health care. They want a lot of orthodontics do yeah. not give dental benefits, which is kind of ironic. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that. Kind of I've ironic. heard that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, general dentists can give yeah. it because they can do most of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if there's a cavity yeah. or whatever. But a lot of orthodontists don't give mm -hmm. dental benefits. Vacation time is going to become more important. You can't give this benefit, but working from home is a benefit that a lot of employers are giving in the business world or working from home part time or paying part of right. a gas allowance or things mm -hmm. like that. So there are a lot of different benefits right. and you need to tune into what matters to your orthodontic team because that's how you keep them. What matters to your okay. team is very important. So those are four items that are being okay. reported by our respondents. I agree with all of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, as, a, as the CEO of a consulting firm, okay. these are all great ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Good to know that they're on track there. Um, okay, so let's talk about starts and orthodontic fees. So uh, the average number of total starts per orthodontist for, let's see, bracket and wires, we reported 204 is the average right. number of starts per orthodontist. Average fee for complete treatment for brackets and wires, was 6,287, and then clear liners, we had 83 average annual starts per orthodontist and an average fee of com for complete treatment, $6,467. Well, the right, first so thing the is what's here? happening with aligners. You know, again, anything I do in ortho, what's mm -hmm. the aligner effect, I call it. I look at that intensely. Mm -hmm. uh, it was fairly flat in growth mm -hmm. last year in orthodontic practices. There is going to be an explosion. I'm still okay. predicting five years from now, it might be as high as 70%. Uh, everything's getting better. The AI is getting better. The biggest company's done 22 million plus mm -hmm. cases. If, I'm in the ballpark anyway. Um, we know yeah. so much more. We can do it for teens. We can do it for uh, younger kids now. It's be, again, market forces. It started with adults, mm -hmm. then aligners went to teens, then it went to younger, and eventually we'll be doing them in utero. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably the next few years. But the point <laughs> So it's very interesting. Yep. <laughs> Aligners have not grown as much in ortho. Obviously, they're 95% plus in general dentistry because that's all they can do. Uh, but having mm. said that, I think aligners, in the next few years, I'll be shocked if these numbers don't explode as because there are more and more parents and patients okay. that are just not going to tolerate anything else. They want aligners. And there'll be practices mm -hmm. that are more than happy to yeah. do that for them if your practice doesn't. What's really interesting are the fees. You know, when we first mm -hmm. started with aligners, partly because of that $1,800 lab fee that was out there, everybody put a much higher aligner fee mm -hmm. than a bracket and wire fee. They also didn't have, the competition yeah. was between orthodontic practices, not all these other service delivery models. Well, now that that's changed, I'm not surprised mm -hmm. that the bracket and wire fee and the aligner fee are pretty close. They're within a couple hundred dollars of each other Okay. And that's the big takeaway. Yeah. Watch your fees because you are competing. Uh, you could, you don't have to have the highest fees. Mm -hmm. You have to have higher volume, which means more systems, better staff training, more scripting, better run practice, more efficiency. You can be very profitable that way. But if you raise your fees too high, you're going to lose a lot of cases. And the tolerance, we're, I still predict we're going to see okay. orthodontic practices with two tiered fees where the, the 62 and 6400 mm -hmm. is the high end. I, listen, I know there are $10,000 cases out mm -hmm. there, um, and maybe half of that might yeah. be the lower end. And I think we're going to see both, again, market forces. Otherwise, mm. what 
practices will start doing it when they don't have enough starts. We're not there yet. I hope we never get there, but unfortunately, oh, okay. I think we're going to get there. Yeah. Okay. So now let's look at uh, the changes in patient visit intervals of so the time between checks. So for, let's see, treatment for bracket and wire, for in-person visits, we've got seven weeks is the average time between visits. For, re for remote monitoring visits for bracket and wire, we've got eight weeks. And then clear liners, we've got 10.1 weeks for in-person visits and 14.7 for remote monitoring visits. So what's the takeaway here? Well, there's several takeaways. Uh, first yeah. of all, uh, it's up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, bracket and wire, seven weeks, remote monitoring, eight weeks. I want to mm -hmm. tell everyone before I make any more comments, I'm not mm -hmm. speaking clinically. We have never yeah. told an orthodontist how to practice. That's not what mm -hmm. we do. But we yeah. can tell them what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. With aligners, 10.1 weeks and remote monitoring, 14.7. So let me tie some thoughts together. Remote mm -hmm. monitoring is going to grow very, very quickly. Uh, it will become part of every ortho practice in the country or 90% of them and in, in the, within five years. It's just there. Mm -hmm. Now, anybody yeah. listening that doesn't like remote monitoring, and that's a lot of you, I understand that today. Mm -hmm. But remember, there were, we didn't like aligners when they first came out either. We, there, we don't like a lot of things when they first happen. Yeah. I, I'm mm -hmm. going to predict that this is going to be huge. The market forces are there. I'm studying it. It's getting, it's getting better monthly. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of practices have no idea how to manage it. They don't know how to put in place a remote monitoring staff member. They don't know how to make it work, but it's going to come. Yeah. And we're, we're, it's so important. We're starting to incorporate how to manage it into our consulting because we're mm -hmm. there. But, you know, again, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to be behind for people. And if somebody doesn't mm -hmm. need it, fine. But we're putting in our program how to deal with it because we're there. So, okay. but here, here's what I'm going to say, and this is my opinion now, it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. These intervals are way too short. Uh, okay. I think we're going to find, I have clients, very fine orthodontists, very mm -hmm. dedicated, very smart, where it's, with aligners, it's 18 weeks between intervals, but with remote monitoring, it's 24 to 28 weeks. We even have somebody at 32 weeks. And mm -hmm. as far as I know, they're highly dedicated. They're not, we know they're not getting negative feedback because we survey yeah. patients in our program. And again, mm -hmm. ultimately, they want a beautiful smile. I always explain to orthodontists and TCs, forget everything else, gear everything toward one thing, the beautiful mm -hmm. smile. But mm -hmm. these intervals are going to grow. And I encourage orthodontists, take a hard look at making them longer. You don't have, you know, I'm not telling you how to practice. If you don't believe yeah. in it, that's fine. But otherwise, yeah. you're only at this cycle because of basic habits and your comfort zone but with remote monitoring, everything's going to change. We, we have a, a company in Europe also for dental, mm -hmm. or, dental and ortho consulting. And in yeah. Europe, they're orthodontists that see the patient for the start. And everything else is remote monitoring. Now, I'm not promoting oh, okay. that. That's not my mm -hmm. role. I'm not a clinician. But mm -hmm. Europe's way ahead of us in terms of the intervals. Mm -hmm. And they're comfortable okay. with it. Now, somebody okay. might say, well, they're not as high quality as we are. I'm, I'm going to challenge that. We won't know for a little while, but mm -hmm. I think they're just more open to this particular methodology of interval mm -hmm. setting. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, we also asked the question of how, what type of appointments doctors are conducting yeah. remotely. So the number one uh, type of appointment was the orthodontic check. Uh, then we did new patient consults, retainer checks, emergencies, and then new patient exam. What kind of was your takeaway from that? Oh, it makes perfect sense. I think orthodontists often view the check as of minor importance. Now, if you've got to change mm -hmm. a wire or something, that's fine. But the orthodontic mm -hmm. check is just that. It's a check. I mean, that's, that's what orthodontists do most of the afternoon. Check, check, check. Yeah. Frankly, a lot of staff members can do it pretty well. So 72% are using some type of monitoring or teledentistry for mm -hmm. checks. And Ortho is the only part of dentistry really using teledentistry. It's under 3% in general practice. It's not going anywhere. You know, during the pandemic, everybody was predicting where it was going to go and wanted to invest mm -hmm. in the companies. And these aren't microchips. Uh, teledentistry is going to have a very minor role in general practice, oral surgery, endo, perio, yeah. pedo. But for ortho, it's fantastic. You can save mm -hmm. so much time. I love it for checks. Yeah. 
I would do as many checks as you can remotely. Mm -hmm. In terms of the new patient consult, be... Yeah, what about that? Well, here's the thing. Be careful. Okay. The technology is fine, but we mm -hmm. don't know what happens when you don't have a live meeting and re consult and relationship. I am very okay. concerned about practices trying to do their new patient uh, exams and consults uh, remotely. I, I think that, I don't think that's going to be good. You need to get okay. that parent and patient in to select you. Mm -hmm. uh, third, retainer checks. I, I have said for 30 years, again, my opinion, do mm -hmm. two, and they, and by the way, they won't show up for the second one anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, 50% oh, of retainer checks don't come in on average. I yeah. mean, think about that, 50%. Mm -hmm. So right. they're just a waste of time. They eat up chair time. You're mm -hmm. never getting back. Uh, you're mm -hmm. losing it permanently. So I love it for retainer checks. I think I think remote monitoring for retainers will be over 70% within in five years easily. Okay. Emergencies, fantastic. Because what you're really determining mm -hmm. is, do they need to come in? That's all. And how quickly Yeah, is it an emergency? Right. <laughs> yeah. Stop exactly. blowing up your schedule and, and do, do a remote uh, exam. And finally, mm -hmm. the new patient exam. Again, be careful. Right now, I would advise clients get new patients into your office so you can control okay. the incredible new patient experience mm -hmm. and they start with you. So, okay. uh, but ortho checks, that's only gonna rise and rise and rise. That's the easy one. Okay. And that's uh, almost double the next closest remote monitoring. Okay, so another uh, issue that came out of the, the survey findings was we found that almost one quarter, 22% of orthodontic practices do not have a full-time treatment coordinator. <laughs> What's the takeaway from that? I, I, it's the first time we've asked that, and I was shocked. Yeah. I was absolutely mm -hmm. shocked the way we yeah. asked it. Um, if you don't have a TC, get one. <laughs> Number one, yeah. they will save the orthodontist so much time. You know, even though ortho goes chair to chair to chair, you still have mm -hmm. to look at it from a doctor production standpoint. Every time a doctor's at a mm -hmm. chair, that's production. Every time a doctor's at a consult, that's not production. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me, got to sneeze there. Mm -hmm. um, so we want orthodontists in the main clinical area with parents patients and adult patients as much as possible. We, the throughput, the volume we can put through is much bigger in most ortho practices. Remember, let's cycle back to the beginning. They're mostly running $500,000 a year production below potential. So mm -hmm. you want to get a TC. Number two, the TC is going to spend more time. These are our consults. You build relationships. Mm -hmm. You learn about the parent, the patient. You learn why they're there. You build commonality. And what we teach, and we teach it minute by minute, step by step, build a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not just a sales job. It is building a relationship to build trust to get a start. That's what you really want. You want mom going home, and 80% of the time it's mom saying to her husband, "We this is where we need to go. This, this is the right place. Mm -hmm. We're not going to another place for $400 right. less. Because the husband wasn't there. It's typically the husband... Mm -hmm. When mom comes home and says, oh, we went to the orthodontist today, and says, get another opinion. So, mm -hmm. you know, because even in our equal world, husbands do a lot more of the daily uh, checking account. Yeah. They're watching some of the money. Right. And, and men okay. are often more likely to bid it out, uh, especially mm -hmm. if they didn't hear okay. the presentation. So you need okay. a TC that's trained exactly what to do. And the TCs today mm -hmm. are not the TCs of even five years ago. They need to mm -hmm. understand there's competition out there. You need to be building okay. your scripting to incorporate why come here before anybody asks you or doesn't bother to ask you. So the TC mm -hmm. today has to build value, not just explain orthodontics. You can't take a former assistant and stick them in that role with no training and expect them to do well. This is a professional sales position to build relationships, engender trust, and create starts. And then measure them and measure them and measure them. Yeah. Okay. So what's your overall message to our listeners and our readers? Well, I started by saying the word from this survey is stability. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Stable is good. But stable doesn't stay stable. And when I look at the trends, 
between an economy where some basic goods and staples are costing more money, and that's what people look at, in a, in a uh, competitive landscape where we have DSOs and general dentists doing more with the liners, uh, we have ortho-only DSOs, but we've got the big boys and girls, as I call them, starting to bring in more ortho because it's lucrative. Right. We've got mm -hmm. staffing challenges, and which even if we put aside the frustration and headaches, we've got higher overhead that needs to be offset by higher production. So my message is, if there was ever a time to organize your practice, streamline it with systems, get everything in place as mm -hmm. if you were declining, even if you're not, this is that time. Because right now we're stable. Okay. So you've got time mm -hmm. to get it right. But if we happen to go into some decline, as I think a lot of practices will in the next years, not I'm not gloom and doom, okay. not tomorrow, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. the best time to build is before you have a problem and it's also easier and faster. But I'll end where I started. Any practice can do well if it applies the right methodologies and systems and practice management. But you can't just rely on that economic law of supply and demand anymore. It's not as much in our favor as it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Levin, thank you so much for taking the time to break this all down for our readers and our yeah. listeners. Thank you, Allison. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Great. Well, and to those of you who want to learn more about the survey, it will be in our upcoming April-May issue, which will, if you don't get it in the mail, then you can also find it at the AAO at our booth. And you can also find the article online. And we'll have a link to the, the full article with this podcast if you go visit our website. So thank you for joining us. And thank you again, Dr. Levin. As always, thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Orthodontic Products Podcast to keep up with the latest episodes. And be sure to check out orthodontproductsonline.com to keep up with the latest industry news. Until next time, take care.